Well, let's come on. Okay. Is that your coffee or something? Uh, I just, it's mine. You better find it. I'll put it there so we're going to be set in the evening and then eat dinner. Okay, is the camera rolling? Yes. The camera's rolling. Our next candidate is John Ware. Ray. Ray. Ray, excuse me. And uh, John, what we have is the seven scorecards, the summary, uh, the permission for the video, the rules for the vetting procedure, and I have a name card. If you'll open that up, it's not been. Uh, Thank you. Carla moved it where nobody could get in those envelopes. Yes, it's well sealed. That's the first test. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to pass that test. Mm -hmm. The testers don't cut yourself. Right. <laughs> Our last candidate did it in what, 45 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> we test them on speed. Huh? So you're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm going to get up there. Okay, so I should. Yeah, uh, yeah. There we go, in the center. All right. I think I got it all. All right. And what we'll need to do is all this is in here, and you'll need to endorse that and date it, and I'll do the same, and here's a pen. Yeah, I apologize. I don't have a pen. Very good. Is that the one that says about his firstborn son and his retirement we get and all that kind of stuff? Right. Okay. Today is the These are the same documents you received at home? Yes. And we're yes. Going to, <clears throat> Bill's going to read the rules. Okay. After he reads the rules, we're going to give you two minutes to give your speech. Okay. Sorry. Answers you can review and make sure there's, they're not marked. Okay. No, it looks looks to be in order. Okay. And what we discussed that we kind of learned a while ago is is after your answer is completed, then uh, we're going to have about a five second pause and then we're going to start with the next question. Okay. 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 Sure. I have a two minute timer. Um, it, 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 uh, we will uh, get 30 seconds, and whether I need to use this or not, or whether the honking on the phone will will let you know you're done. Stop. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read these uh, uh, Ellis County Tea Party rules for vetting procedures. Okay. Uh, for you, you've read them, but for the camera, no one is allowed to be in the room except for the vetting panel and the candidate. All electronics will be turned off except for laptops and video recorders used by the vetting panel. Cell phones and voice recorders shall be turned off in the room. No written material or notes will be taken by the candidate. Ellis County Tea Party vetting panel and candidate agree that all questions and responses at this vetting session are to remain confidential until video are uploaded and considered public information on the ECTP website at www.ellscountyteaparty.org. Verbal questions will be asked and verbal responses to those questions will be given. Answers will be limited to two minutes per question. During the video session, no follow-up questions will be asked, nor will the candidate be given any explanation of the questions. Candidate may request for a repeat of a question at the time the question is first asked. The candidate may request a copy of the vetting interview recording for a fee of $5. Recordings will not be released until video is posted on the ECTP website and the fee has been received. And that is what you uh, signed and we represent uh, witness. Correct. Correct. And uh, with that, um, now you have uh, two minutes for opening statement. Okay, very good. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I. Uh, First off, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of God and of Jesus Christ. I was raised uh, by my mother and 
my grandmother's in a traditional Christian way, and I feel that it's very important to acknowledge my faith, first and foremost. In addition to that, I'm a husband to Michelle. Uh, Michelle and I have been married for 17 years. We got married in 1996. I am a father to Patrick and to Morgan. Morgan is my 12-year-old daughter. She attends uh, Wasatchie Public Schools at Howard Junior High School. She's a seventh grader. And my son Patrick is nine years old. He attends uh, St. Joseph's Catholic School in Waxahachie. And I want to mention that first because I think faith and family are the two most important things. And I try, in the hustle and bustle of life, I try to keep that, keep that in mind. And that's important to me, and I want you to know that. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a native of Waxahachie. I grew up here in, uh, or in Waxahachie. Uh, I'm a multi-generational Ellis County resident. Both of my parents, my mom and dad, are both uh, Ellis County natives, as well as three of my four grandparents, and I can go back further than that. Um, I attended Waxahachie Public Schools from first through 12th grade. I graduated in 1989. I then attended uh, Texas A&M University, where I got a bachelor's degree. I attended the University of Texas Law School, where I got a law degree. I worked in Houston for a brief while, and I moved back to Waxahachie, my hometown, in 2002. I moved back here because I love this place. I love this entire area, and it means a lot to me. Uh, I am a small business owner. I co-own a title company with offices in Ellis County. Uh, I'm sorry, Bill. Does that mean That's 30 you? seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I co-own a title company. I have. Uh, several real estate investments in Ellis County, and I have a real estate and corporate and business law law practice. And uh, those are the fundamental aspects of, of who I am and where I come from. Thank you, John. Okay, we're going to start with the questions. This is the candidate vetting questions based on the six tenants, six tenants excuse me, of the Ellis County Tea Party. Uh, our first group is the general topics. And the first question is, define for us the roles and responsibilities of the elected position for which you are applying. And what are your qualifications to fill this position? Right, I'm running for state representative for the Texas House of Representatives. Uh, the, that's, of course, part of the Texas legislature. The main thing that the Texas legislature does is adopt a budget for the state for our buying. The state has a biennium budget, a budget that applies for a two-year cycle. The legislature meets an odd number of years for 140 days during the regular session, and our primary duty there is to adopt a budget. The other duties that the legislature uh, carries out, which I would be part of as a member of the House of Representatives, is to perform uh, fundamental government services of transportation, uh, public safety, such as the Department of Public Safety, uh, and um, uh, transportation, public safety, and I apologize, I'm a bit nervous, but I'll That's all right. <coughs> uh, and there's several other things it does which are questionable as whether it should be doing, such as TCEQ, uh, oh, and public, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in addition to uh, transportation, we also have water infrastructure that we manage as well. And uh, those, are, those are the things that the legislature does. It, I think the legislature is imposed upon by very, various interest groups to do other things, which, as I mentioned, are questionable. But in my opinion, what the Texas legislature mainly does is provide for public uh, education, public safety, and transportation. Turn your, your volume a little louder. Sure, yeah. sure. Sorry. Sure, of course. Thank you. Okay, question number two. Compare and contrast how you will do the job better than your predecessor. Okay. Um, let me tell you this. I, uh, first off, I believe that I, and I, I, I'm not here to, to state anything negative about my predecessor. Uh, he's, you know, uh, he, he's, Represented our, our district for 22 years, and I think that uh, you know we owe him uh, some respect for doing that, and uh, I appreciate his service. The things that I want to do are to listen to what the folks in the district want, 
I believe that uh, serving this position as well as the positions I've served in before, uh, that I am a public servant and that I'm serving the public and I want to listen to what the district wants and I want to listen to what voters in the district want. I want to have an open door policy and if folks here uh, have certain um, issues that are important to them, I want to be responsive to that and follow through and to do what folks in the district want. So it is my intention as your state representative to follow your wishes and to do what I'm hearing from the vast majority of folks in the district as far as what they want. I believe that my, uh, first off, I'm, I'm here, I'm local, I'm a small business owner, I have conservative values, I'm raising a family, I feel like I understand what the vast majority of folks in the district, especially Republicans, want from their government, and I feel like I can carry through with that and do that in accordance with what folks here are wanting to see and see happen at the state level. Was that loud enough then? Yes. A little better. Okay, our next sec section is going to be In God We Trust. Yes. It's where do you stand on faith-based issues like abortion, <clears throat> sanctity of marriage, and separation of church and state? Sure. Uh, I'm pro-life. I believe that life begins at conception, and I believe that life needs to be protected uh, unquestionably. I mean, I really don't have any waivers, equivocations, uh, or wiggle room in that. That's the way I feel. I think that's important, and that's uh, those are the types of policies that I would espouse uh, as a state legislator. Can you mind telling me the other two, Linda? Um, sanctity of marriage. Okay. And then separation of church and state. Yeah. Uh, sanctity of marriage, I believe that uh, marriage is, is between a man and a woman. I believe that that's, that's Bible-based, and that's the way God intended it to be. And uh, I believe that our laws and policies and tax policies and statutes of the state of Texas should, should support that and encourage that and not, not hurt that or damage that in any way. Uh, and the last one, I'm sorry. Separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. state. Well, that's a phrase that does not appear in the U.S. Constitution, as uh, many people know. And uh, I think that our U.S. Supreme Court has gone overboard with interpreting the freedom of religion. And uh, I, you know, there's an old joke about anyone who's ever taken an algebra test knows that there's plenty of religion in uh, public schools, for example. And I think that. Uh, I think that where we've gotten with uh, uh, separation of church and state is misguided. I think that freedom of religion means that you have the freedom to practice your religion in a public setting through public school and through government. And uh, uh, I want to support that concept and that notion through uh, uh, policies and statutes of the state of Texas. Hold one. I gotta check this camera. Done gone wacky. That's why we have two. The executive branch of the federal government has been intimidating Christian churches into self-censorship. Do you agree with that statement? And if so, what would you propose to do to restore the freedom of free speech to pulpits in Texas? Uh, yeah, I, I do think, you know, I've heard statements. I've never had any personal experience with uh, with seeing this happen or having it related to me, but I do understand that some, you know, ministers and churches are now afraid that they can't speak on uh, religious topics from the pulpit. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've never, oddly, and I've often wondered about this in my own church experiences, I've never had a, a politically based sermon, which I find odd. I do. Uh, but I do understand that some. Uh, churches feel that they can't, or some pastors feel that they can't speak on political topics for fear that they would lose their tax-exempt status, for example, through the IRS. Uh, I think that's silly. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that, that fear is coming from uh, what the federal government might do, which the state legislature, you know, obviously we can't, 
say for sure what the IRS or what the federal government's going to do, but I do think we at the state legislative level could, for example, adopt a, a law similar to the law about uh, using the phrase Merry Christmas in public schools. We at the state legislature could adopt a law protecting uh, the right to free speech in churches, and then if some church gets, uh, gets in, harassed by the Internal Revenue Service, that we at the state level through the Texas Attorney General's office could file a lawsuit against the federal government uh, to ascertain uh, what the extent of the power of the IRS is in that, in, that, in that regard, and I think it's nil, and I think that we would win if we had that kind of, uh, of case go up before the federal courts, but that's, that's one aspect of what I would do. There may be other things, but that's certainly what comes to mind. I think that's a right that needs to be protected, and I think that uh, pastors from the pulpit should be able to speak about the issues. Good. Right on time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number five. Will you sponsor <coughs> or co-sponsor legislation to allow Judeo Christian prayer in school, including at school events. I have absolutely no problem with sponsoring or co sponsoring that. I believe in that. Yes. What does In God We Trust mean to you? I, it means to me <laughs> that life is uncertain, you know, and I, I we all deal with that every day. I, I have no idea whether I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I, I don't know whether I'm going to have enough money in my checking account on the 15th to pay the light bill. And I think that in God we trust means that uh, it's not about us. We're not doing these things uh, on our own. Uh, we're doing this because of, uh, of a guiding hand and, and providence of a loving God. And uh, we need to acknowledge that and recognize that and uh, uh, give thanks to God and be good stewards of God's blessings. That's what it means to me. Do you believe that as Americans, we should allow the few non-Judeo Christians to dictate what is acceptable or tolerable to the majority and explain your answer? Sure. Uh, no, I do not. And, uh, I, I think that part of uh, what you're asking there, Mike, relates to the one aspect of just political correctness, and uh, I don't... I think that that is, is something that has just reached levels of hysteria and has gone overboard. I do not believe that we should tiptoe, if, if we all have traditional Judeo-Christian values, I don't think that we should put those values in a closet and hide them and tiptoe around those aspects of our culture for the purpose of trying not to offend other people. Uh, I think that uh, traditional folks that, that follow traditional Judeo-Christian values have as much right to assert those values and espouse those values and, and proudly wave them uh, to other members of society as any other member does. And I believe that, so you asked me how I felt about it and then the second part of your question was, I'm sorry. Explain it. Explain it. Uh, so I, I don't feel that we should do that. Uh, tiptoe around uh, a minority uh, uh, culture or uh, a minority sense of values and, and hide our own for the purpose of not offending others. I don't believe in that. We're going to move to national and Texas sovereignty. The eighth question is, explain your understanding of the ninth and the Tenth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Sure. Uh, both of those uh, clauses to the U.S. Constitution reserve powers not specifically delegated to the federal government to both the people and to the states. And, uh, you know, what I believe is that uh, a couple of things is that... Whoops, that, that was for the last one. I apologize. No, that's okay. So I get a little extra time on this one. Starting the clock late. Uh, 
I think that uh, I think that one thing about that those two amendments is it's designed to limit the power of the federal government. It's designed to rein in what the federal government is supposed to do to those powers enumerated in the first seven articles of the Constitution and in the amendments. And uh, that's number one. That's number one, the first thing I think it's, it's supposed to do. Uh, and for example, the Constitution says nothing about the federal government being involved in education, but we have a U.S. Department of Education. Uh, so I believe that that's outside of the constitutional delegation of powers to the federal government. So that's one aspect of it. But secondarily is I believe that these amendments give um, the states and the people a tool to help rein in federal government power when the federal government is exceeding its enumerated powers under the Constitution. And I think that we as a state, as the state of Texas and as a state government, need to, need to use that tool and look at that tool to try to rein in and protect ourselves from uh, an intrusive federal government. Question nine, what will you do to protect and preserve state sovereignty? Well, I want to tell you uh, a couple things about that. One is that I think that we, the federal government's gotten bigger and states have lost sovereignty over time. It's been incremental. It's that concept of death by a thousand cuts or the, uh, the frog in the pan of water and the heat is sl uh, slowly turned up. And in order to rein back some of that state sovereignty, so sovereignty, we are going to have to be incremental and strategic and look for opportunities to win those rights back. And I want to do that, and I feel like I have the skill and the experience to do that. What we, what, you know, I've been studying some proposals from the Tenth Amendment Institute of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. They have several good suggestions, which I like. One of which is that uh, the federal government has created a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of regulations, to more than they can ever manage. And they are dependent upon state government to enforce these things and to apply these laws. And one of the ways in which the states can push back on this is to simply enact state statutes that say state law enforcement or state agencies should not enforce these, some of these federal laws that we disagree with. Force the federal government if they want to, to enforce it themselves. But we're also creating the opportunity to have federal court cases wherein, wherein we can rein back our state sovereignty and push back against the federal government. Because the federal government started pulling these powers away from us through US Supreme Court decisions, beginning with uh, the populist movements following the Industrial Revolution. And of course, it gained a lot of speed after the Depression and the New Deal. And we have to, we have to just use that same model to get test cases to start whittling those rights back. I, I could have stopped that a few right. seconds. I just wanted to let you know. How yeah, I've gotten over my jitters. I'm in my, in my, uh, in my zone now. OK, next question. Explain your understanding of Article 5 of the US Constitution, especially the state's role. Yeah. Uh, you know, Article 5 allows uh, a certain uh, percentage of, of the state legislatures to call a constitutional convention. And, uh, you know, I think that Texas, the Texas legislature from 1978, has a pending uh, call for an Article 5 constitutional convention. It's never been withdrawn. I think uh, uh, some constitutional scholars would, would debate as to whether it's stale and how long these calls last. And, and do the states have to do it all together in a certain, within a certain time frame? I think we have uh, a call for a constitutional convention from the state of Texas that's still out there. And I know that there's uh, a lot of discussion about using such a state called Article 5 constitutional convention uh, to try to uh, redefine, or not really redefine, but to be more precise and, and more clear to rein in. Uh, an overactive federal judiciary on some of these constitutional issues and to get tax and expenditure limits from the federal government, uh, to get them to stop abusing the Commerce Clause, to, to regulate any aspect of our economy, that type of thing. So I, I think the state legislature has the power under Article 5, the state, the 
Texas legislature to call a constitutional convention. Uh, right now, you know, the Republican Party of Texas 2012 platform, you know, the way I interpret the platform says the Republican Party does not support calling an Article 5 constitutional convention. So I think that we as Republicans need to get on the same page on that. Uh, and uh, I, I want to hear from a lot of, you know, a lot of folks on how they feel about calling such a constitutional convention because it, it does concern me that the platform of the party says that we shouldn't do that. But I think it's an interesting concept and I know that there's folks out there, you know, like Mr. Levin and the former mm -hmm. Reagan uh, Attorney General Assistant advocates that. So anyway. your position regarding the use of foreign contractors for state funded projects? Uh, let me I have uh, some, sometimes core fundamental beliefs bump up against each other and I believe very strongly in a free economy and a free market and that uh, the government should stay out of regulating uh, the free market as much as possible. So on the one hand, I would say that you know we should we should give the, a project to the lowest bidder, the person that can do it the most efficiently, the most economically, and get the most value from for our state. Uh, on the other hand, you know I, I think that anyone is, who is performing the work needs to do it properly and legally, and with with uh, employees who are citizens of, of our you know are, are properly in our country who are paying their, their share of the taxes, because if we don't require folks to do that, we are penalizing the folks that are following the rules, and we are rewarding those who don't follow the rules. So uh, my approach is to uh, try not to regulate, to over-regulate uh, the use of the economy and government services, but at the same time, let's make sure that whoever we are employing uh, to provide roadways or infrastructure projects or contract <coughs> services, let's make sure that they're following the rules and employing people that are properly in our country and in our state. Number 12, what would you propose to end the practice of converting existing highways to toll roads? Okay, I think that first off, we have we have a, a growing population, and we have got to provide the infrastructure for that growing population. That's a, that's a challenge in the state of Texas. It's going to be a challenge in the near term, certainly. And uh, what I would first propose to do is, po with population growth comes tax base growth. We also have our tax base is growing through oil and gas. Activity in our state. So the first thing I would I would propose to do is to try to provide for our infrastructure needs, uh, including uh, roadways, through the gross growth of the tax base. I, don't, I would not support in any way the creation of new taxes or uh, an increase in the tax rate in these, of any existing taxes. So I would first propose that we. Uh, through the growth of the tax base, try to solve our infrastructure problems that way, try to cut unnecessary spending so that we have the funds available to provide for the, for the roadways and the water needed to keep up with the population growth. Uh, that's what I would prefer to do instead of having toll roads. I think there could be instances where there are uh, uh, specific use or specific locations where if we don't have any other choice, a toll road might be the most appropriate way to do it, uh, to place the burden for the use of the road upon the people that are actually using it. But I do think that our highway system and our roadway system in Texas benefits our overall Texas economy. The rising tide lifts all boats. It's a, it's a duty of the state of Texas to provide these roadways uh, and to do it without imposing tolls. Thank you. 
federalism is? Federalism is we have uh, two completely separate independent aspects of the government. The uh, states are their independent state governments and they are bound together through a, a federation of our U.S. Constitution which creates a completely separate government and those two governments operate independently. And our state government is what we call a unitary government, meaning that our cities and our school districts and our other special districts are creations of the state legislature and are uh, subdivisions of the state government. The state governments are not creations of the federal government, and they are not subdivisions of the federal government. The states have their own separate independent governments, and uh, they are separate and sovereign from the federal government. That's federalism to me. The Third Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. What does it mean to you and explain its relevance and importance today? Okay, I, I believe the Third Amendment is the one about quartering soldiers in peacetime, or am I, do, do you mind? I can only repeat the question. Okay. Uh, can you repeat it one more time? Yes, sir. The Third Amendment to the U.S. Constitution what does it mean to you and explain its relevance and importance today? Okay. I, uh, I have a feeling I'm, I'm not on the right, on the right amendment. The, the one that comes to mind is the, the amendment on ordering soldiers in peacetime. And I suspect that's, that is not the right one. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I can't off the top of my head remember which is what the context of the Third Amendment is. I know the first, the second, the fifth, the ninth, the tenth. Uh, I get a little fuzzy and have to refer back to my, uh, to my reference on, on some of the ones in between. Question 15, what is your understanding and position regarding the Texas Nationalist Movement? The Texas Nationalist Movement. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, Morris, I'm not familiar with that exact phrase on exactly what the Texas Nationalist Movement is referring to. Okay, number 16. This is the last question in the National Texas Sovereignty Group. Would you be willing to push for a convention of the states to amend the U.S. Constitution? And if so, what new amendments would you favor and what amendments would you repeal? I, I'm interested in the idea, yes, Marty. I, I mentioned to you earlier that you know the 2012 Republican Party platform uh, takes a 180-degree opposite view that, that the Constitution shouldn't be amended and, and that the state legislature should withdraw its prior request for a constitutional convention. So uh, I'm concerned that, that the Republican Party is not all on, all on the same page on that. I want to get to the bottom of that. And, uh, but I, I think it's a very interesting idea. I, one of the things that, uh, well really two things that I think that we should look into from a from reigning in the federal government are a tax and expenditure limit, you know, limiting the growth of the federal government's budget or limiting the ability of the federal government to raise taxes uh, to either population growth or growth of the GDP or, you know, maybe an exception for wartime or some, uh, some extreme emergency. But I think we should look into a tax or expenditure limit for the federal government. And the next is I think a lot of the growth of the, you know, the federal government was kept in check through U.S. Supreme Court decisions up until, you know, roughly the 1930s by virtue of the Commerce Clause, you know, and then all of a sudden the U.S. Supreme Court is, you know, the switch in time to save nine, you may have heard of, in the 1930s, the U.S. Supreme Court started interpreting the Commerce Clause more liberally. 
in a more activist, in a more activist way. We need to uh, more clearly define that the Commerce Clause does not extend to all of these situations that the, that the federal government thinks it extends to. Okay, the next section is going to be fiscal responsibility. Yes. How should Texas continue to fund the necessary needs of government? First off, I, I don't want, I wouldn't raise taxes in any way. Uh, there is some, I think there are opportunities to uh, shift or migrate the tax system from one, from one tax approach to another, a tax swap, so to speak, that does not raise the overall tax burden. You know, I would be certainly looking to, to doing that. I want to fund the government uh, a, a couple things. One is I want to fund the government in a way that promotes job growth and promotes the Texas economy as much as possible, number one. And number two, I know that we, pre we have a tax and expenditure limit in the state of Texas that doesn't seem to be working. Uh, there are some proposals and there's some momentum to uh, modify the tax and expenditure limit for the state of Texas and I would support that so that we can uh, make sure that, you know, through politics, playing politics, we don't let our state government size get out of control the way the federal government has. Uh, I do like uh, the proposals to shift some of our, uh, you know, we primarily raise funds through the, the franchise tax the property tax and uh, the sales tax. There are some, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about shifting some of our, our tax raising mechanisms from the property tax to the sales tax and uh, I suspect there will be a follow up question down the line on that. Uh, so I won't go into that in great detail but I, I do like that in, in concept. If elected, what would you do to eliminate the federally mandated requirement imposed on Texas? Uh, the thing that I will do that, uh, a couple of things, one is I want to reject any expansion of Medicaid. Uh, you know, I will vote, for in, vote against any effort to expand the Medicaid program in Texas. Number two, I would like to look at legislation that as I mentioned earlier, proposed by the Tenth Amendment Center, uh, that would um, instruct state employees and state agencies and state law enforcement that they don't have to enforce some of these things. And uh, that might result in uh, lawsuits between the state and the federal government or lawsuits between the state of Texas and, and sister states might join us. And uh, I would support that. You know, I would support that and make sure that our Texas Attorney General has the resources he needs to adequately um, litigate those cases. And secondarily, to make sure that we pass statutes that give them a chance to win. <laughs> you know, that we, we pass statutes that are strategic. And what I can tell you is, although I think there are times to uh, register a protest through a statute or a vote, uh, if you really want to get something done, you probably need to be strategic about getting it done. And there's a U.S. Supreme Court case that says nullification doesn't work. It's from the 1950s. If we just have a blanket state statute that says we nullify this federal law, federal courts will have absolutely no trouble kicking that out. So we have to follow some of these recommendations from the Tenth, the Tenth Amendment Center, for example, to uh, uh, provide our state attorney general with some state legislation that he has a chance of winning with in the federal courts in front of the federal government. Number 19, what would justify using the Economic Stabilization Fund and explain your answer? Yeah, first of all, I, I think we have to, uh, I'm going to give my, my overview on this, is we have to come up with, and as I sit here today, I don't have the figure, but we have, we have to have a debate and come up with a criteria for how much money should be in the Economic Stabilization Fund, whether it's 
a certain percentage of the preceding biennium's budget, whether it's a certain number of days of operating cash for state government. We need an appropriate rainy day fund. Every, every business, every family, as, as well as government, needs an appropriate savings account. So we need to set that economic stabilization fund at, a pro, at an appropriate level. We need to have a debate on that and set it at an appropriate conservative level. Anything above that means that we are unnecessarily overly taxing the citizens of the state of Texas, and we need to return that to the state of Texas and to the taxpayers. The one thing we have uh, pending right now is th that's the path I want to get on. We do have water and road roadway infrastructure issues that we have to work our way through. There, you know, we just had a proposition on using some of the economic stabilization fund and borrowing against it to uh, do water projects. And uh, you know, we need to address roadways too. That's going to be a tough issue. My personal uh, uh, philosophy though is what I've, what I've shared with you is that we need to have a debate to set it at a conservative level and, uh, you know, possibly have a constitutional amendment or a statute to say what that is, and then anything above that level needs to be returned to the taxpayers in the form of lower taxes. Number 20. Should there be attached to ed every legislative bill a financial impact statement on the economy and jobs? Explain your answer. Uh, yes, I think so, or I, I do agree with that, and uh, my one caveat to, to agreeing with that is this. I don't want to create a bunch of unfunded mandates, and I don't want to create a bunch of new bureaucracy. And if, I think the, the Texas legislature could really mess that up, they could require that on each bill, and the next thing you know, we're building another shiny granite clad building in Austin to house all the bureaucrats to come up with the numbers and the answers to those questions. And that bugs me. I don't want to do that. So, uh, yes, I want to have transparency. Yes, I want to have cost and effect. Yes, I want the legislature to be very conscious of what it is doing and the cost and effect of it. And yes, I want the legislature and the state government and the statutes to have some accountability. The only problem with it is when I think the government monkeys with those things, they tend to create more red tape and more bureaucracy, and we have to be careful about the way we go about that. The next section is personal responsibility. Would you support drug testing for recipients of any and all Texas state assistance programs? Explain your answer. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's appropriate. I do, but I want to make sure that uh, we're not just creating a huge you know, database of personal information. You know, if, if we're having, uh, first off, I think if somebody's getting public assistance saying that they can't work, can't participate in the economy, they need public assistance, we need to make sure that the reason that they're not able to participate in the economy isn't because they're using drugs or that they have a drinking problem. I mean, it, you know, that, to me, that's not a good reason to be on welfare. If you say, I can't work because I want to spend all day laying on the couch using marijuana, that's not a good reason to have public welfare. So I do think we need a mechanism to, to do that. But on the other hand, I'm concerned about government uh, having you know, access to everyone's bodily fluids to mine information about their health or their genetics or their DNA and things of like that. that. That's troubling. So whatever, uh, again, uh, Whatever program we would institute to um, to monitor that certainly needs to have some precautions in it that we're not creating a, a huge government database of pers people's personal information. Number 
Question 22. What is your motivation for running for a $600 a month job? Okay. Yeah, I, I told you earlier I grew up in Waxahachie, and, and I told you about growing up with a traditional Christian background, and uh, my, my motivation is twofold. One is, I spent the first eight years of my life living in a mobile home. I lived in one of the two, uh, I lived in both at one time or another, of the two large mobile home parks on the west side of I-35E in Waxahachie. And uh, I was an only child, I am an only child, uh, and I had very young parents, and my parents worked unskilled jobs, and uh, I remember sitting at home at night and listening to my parents argue about how they were going to get the car fixed, or uh, how we were going to pay a certain bill, and uh, that had a huge impact on my life. But you know, I was able to get a public education. I was able to attend Texas higher education and to get a couple of degrees. I was able to come back here with, with you know, really just just with the sweat of my own brow and self determination able to start some businesses, start a family, raise a family, uh, and, and achieve financial security, achieve hope for tomorrow, achieve uh, a feeling that I will be able to send my kids to college and I'll be able to retire someday. And that is the American dream. And that is under attack. It's constantly under attack. And I want to be sure that that is still there tomorrow and 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 30 years from now for my kids, your kids, my grandkids, your grandkids. I benefited from it. I want to make sure I preserve it. That's number one. Number two, uh, I, you know, I grew up, I believe in the tithe. I really do. I believe in being a good steward of God's blessings. I believe that if you've been, uh, you know, if your master you know, gives you a talent, you shouldn't bury it in the backyard. You know, you should uh, try to return it to him tenfold. And I think it's incumbent upon me to get back. And that's, that's why I'm, those are the two main ways that I would express my mind. Now we start uh, rule of law. Item 23. With the understanding that the federal government has skirted its duty to protect Texas border, what would you propose to curb the flow of illegal immigration? Yeah, first off, <coughs> you're right. Uh, I would, uh, you know, the, the federal government has a constitutional duty to protect the states from invasion and uh, I would seek to pressure the federal government to honor that constitutional duty, and I, that's one thing I would do. And again, I would I would encourage and empower and try to give our state attorney general's office the resource it need, resources it needs to to take on the federal government to enforce this constitutional duty. That's number one. Number two is again as we're you know that fundamental uh, duty of the legislature in setting the budget. Uh, I would look for ways to cut unnecessary spending in, in order to help fund law enforcement in the border region. Uh, and, and I think that we need to, although we should encourage the federal government, force the federal government to honor its duty or discharge its duty, I don't think we should wait on them. I think we've got to do something to stop the flow of illegal drugs, uh, to stop the possibility of terrorists entering our country. Uh, we've got to do that on our own while still trying to recoup the costs or to encourage the federal government uh, to do it themselves. How it, some specifics on how I would do it, I would attempt as the tax base grows and through uh, uh, trying to cut unnecessary funding, I would, I would increase funding for uh, border security. I think that we have some, and again I'm a personal uh, freedoms and, and I don't like the big brother concept of government so I want to be careful about it but I think we could possibly create a border enforcement zone where you know 
within a certain area, it's okay to use certain technologies to keep the border safe. Very good. Okay. Do you believe the U.S. Constitution is a living, breathing document? Explain that, sir. No, I think it says what it says. You know, I think it was, it's in black and white. And uh, I, you know, I've never approached, I've always disliked uh, judicial activism. I've always disliked uh, reading things into statutes that aren't there. And it applies to the Constitution as well. I think it says what it says in black and white. It needs to be interpreted and applied based upon what it says. On limited government, do you have any ideas or proposals to cut spending or the size of government in Austin? Uh, I yeah, I, I would. As I mentioned earlier, I would support the tax and expenditure limit. Uh, we have a current tax and expenditure limit that doesn't appear to be working. Uh, so I would support a tax. A, constitutional tax and expenditure limit limiting this, the growth of the federal, or I'm sorry, not the federal, I would for the federal too, but I, I would support uh, a tax and expenditure limit, limit for the state government limiting the growth of the state budget to the increase in uh, uh, the domestic product of the state of Texas or the population growth, the lesser of those two. So that would be a specific proposal. I, I can tell you that the other thing that we have to do, and as a state legislator, I would have limited ability to control it, but it's the Medicaid program. We've got to lobby our uh, congressional delegation to give us more options on administering the Medicaid program. Right now, that when the state accepts the Medicaid money, we have to apply the Medicaid eligibility rules. We don't have any, any say over that. And we get some federal money, but then we have to apply the rest of it, and we're stuck with these federally mandated eligibility rules, and it, that it's a, quote, entitlement. So if somebody shows up at the window at the Department of Human Services and falls into the eligibility requirements, we, as the state, have to pay that money. And what it needs to be turned into is a block grant program where the federal government just gives us block, block money. It needs to be shrunk, of course, but... Uh, beyond shrinking it, it needs to be a block grant program whereby the money comes to the state and the state gets to set the eligibility requirements. And that way we have more control over it and it doesn't start, it doesn't become a tail that wags the dog. Because if you look at the, at the statistics and the studies on how Medicaid is growing and what it's going to be in 20 years, it will be the largest single expenditure in our state and it will start hurting public education, mm. transportation, and law enforcement. <clears throat> Number 26, where in the U.S. Constitution is the separation of church and state defined? <laughs> Nowhere. It's not in there. That phrase does not, <coughs> does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. Or, or, I'm sorry, the First Amendment guarantees the freedom of religion. ideas or proposals regarding the property tax issue in Texas? I do. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about doing a swap or a shift from the property tax to an end-user consumption tax. I think that's a, a really uh, intriguing idea. I think it, it's, it's good in many, many ways. And I'd like to explore it, and I'd like to, I'd like to hear from voters in House District 10 on how they feel about it. And I would like to be a part of uh, exploring that exciting possibility of a fundamental shift in the way we raise tax revenue in the state of Texas. Uh, it appeals to me that a homeowner can pay off their home and know that they're secure after they pay off their mortgage. They have financial security in their home and that it can't be taken away from them. We do have that to a degree. If you're 65 or older, you know, your home can't be sold to pay the property tax if you fail to pay your property taxes, but the tax is still accruing. When you pass away, 
your family's going to have to sell your house to pay off those taxes. But it would be great to shift away from that so that irrespective of whether you're 65, you know, you have the comfort and financial security in your home once you have your mortgage paid off. I think that's a fundamental American way of life. Uh, so I like that. Um, there are other things about it that I like. I like the fact that, it, that a consumption tax is very transparent. You know, you go and you buy a good or a service, they ring you up at the cash register, you can see exactly what the tax was, so there's no way for it to kind of be hidden in there. Uh, it's easy to administer. You know, we don't need a huge uh, bureaucracy. We don't need a lot of folks at the comptroller's office telling us how to administer it or, or enforcing it. I like that. I like the fact that it's paid by everybody that's consuming goods or services in Texas, uh, whether you're in the country legally or illegally or passing through. So there's several things about it that I like. I have a couple of concerns that we need to work through on the debate as far as what the rate would be. You know, and, and it would be to me it would be bad to trade a property tax on your home for a sales tax on your home. So we have to figure that out. You know, I don't want to I don't want to do that. Regarding nullification of overreaching federal statutes, uh, I wish it would work. You know, I there is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a there's a U.S. Supreme Court case that says it doesn't work. And I know, for example, I think a couple of sessions ago we had the, the state rep from Tyler, uh, Leo Berman, who I believe introduced a, a nullification bill. Uh, either on Obamacare or maybe it was in the TSTA, uh, I'm not, the TSA, uh, I can't remember exactly which. If we do that, we're not, federal courts are not going to have any trouble striking that down as unconstitutional. And as much as I wish that would work, the simple fact is we have to do something more strategic. You know, we have to, we have to follow, if you take this Texas Public Policy Foundation, the 10th Amendment Center, the former head of that 10th Amendment Center, uh, center is Senator Ted Cruz, before he was, he was elected to the Senate. He was a U.S. Supreme Court advocate. I mean, he handles U.S. Supreme Court cases. The 10th Amendment Center does not advocate nullification because they know it doesn't work. If we're going to send our Attorney General or some of these folks in to do battle with the federal government in these courts, we have to arm them with statutes that will work. So we have to arm them with statutes that push the envelope. Don't say nullification. We have to push the envelope so that they can go in and incrementally chip away at our over-intrusive federal government. The same way the federal government <laughs> beginning in the early 20th century started chipping away at state sovereignty. we got to chip away at their powers as well. So I propose rather than, and, and again there may be times, Obamacare is a good example, let's just throw a nullification statute out there to register our protest. But if we really want to make some progress on it, I want to be more strategic about it and follow some of these pushing the envelope examples so that we can have some actual court victories. And then we push the envelope again and get another court victory. And then we push the envelope again and get another court victory. That's what I want to do. Question 29. Would you be in favor of legislation enforcing laws allowing surveillance of Americans in Texas? Uh, I would, no. Not at all. I would not support that at all. I don't, you know, I, I think that as we enter a greater and greater information age and information society, we have to be more and more vigilant about uh, the government collecting information on us. And uh, it troubles me, and I want to look for, uh, you know, I've, I've sprinkled throughout my answers. Uh, I've, I've signaled that troubling uh, feeling I have about it. I don't have all the answers on how to stop it. <laughs> you know, I think that we have to be conscious of it 
as as we're you know creating legislation at the state level, we have to be very conscious of it to not to create opportunities to abuse information gathering by the government. And uh, I am conscious of that, and I will remain vigilant about it as we move forward. And uh, I'm open uh, to suggestions on uh, and ideas from learned people on this topic on how to uh, prevent this <coughs> from getting out of hand. Well, John, here's your last question. <laughs> how many articles <clears throat> and how many amendments are there in the U.S. Constitution? There's seven articles and 27 amendments. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Now, uh, can you get some closing statement? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we're not going to turn the camera off till he leaves the room. Right. Okay. Right. He's a gesture. Oh, okay. Got it. Time, timing me, Bill? One minute. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think through the context of answering the questions, I really uh, hit upon several of the reasons that I'm running for this office. And uh, I do envision this office as being public service. I have tried to, to, to get back to my community, and I really do believe that this is a public service and that I should approach it with a servant's heart, humbly and with transparency and with openness. And I will certainly try to do that. I, I am from this area. I'm from this county. I feel like my experiences in life mirror and match uh, the majority of experiences and values of residents of this county and of this district and Henderson County as well. And uh, I would be honored to be your next state representative. And please consider, uh, please consider voting for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Now you can drink. It's probably cold now. Now you're going to go home and look up the third month. You were right, by the way. It you were right. Oh. You were right. Yeah. You were not sure, but you were right. Um. Well, I should answer Well, I got several people. <laughs> I knew that would be the toughest. Yeah, there, we, right. we had to throw in a couple of you know, kind of guys <laughs> yeah. 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 To, to find out how much studying you've been doing. <laughs> right. right. Well, that, no, I enjoyed, I enjoyed visiting with y'all. I think. We appreciate you yeah. a lot. It's thought provoking. I think you've got a couple of hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>